Hello everyone, Mars Swan here, back at the desk with the one and only Initialize, the one and only Melvin Izzle, and a heretic called Counterfeit. My god, sir, you have defied my league, you have come in here, said I have no credibility, and now we're 2-1 with the Rascal Jesters. What do you have to say for yourself? Well, I mean, to be fair, you know, this season, to an extent, is the story of DFM and Rascal Jester. You know, they bookended the season. They started yeah. it. They ended it. And as we said, right, what well, we say, uh, let's be clear. As I said at the beginning of the broadcast, the LJL is in need of a revolution. And the revolution, of course, is televised. That's what you're seeing here and now. DFM, they've been climbing up onto that mountain again and again, but they have been found wanting. And I think finally time is catching up with them. It's time for the Jesters to take the throne. I'm getting a special news bulletin coming in. Um, Initialize, Hello. I believe, thinks very differently in this urgent news special. I do, but <laughs> I'll also say... Um, the joys of having a juggernaut match is that either one of these teams will still be here one way or the other, still have a second chance here, which is good news for either one, because both of these teams have been going at it hammer and tongs. Um, it's been pretty close for, we've had two one-sided games and one very close one. Either mm. way, it puts Rascal Jester in a very good position right now, and I think a lot of it as well has been uh, Sol and Secret really stepping up, and Hatchimetcha finally, I think, really kind of getting a bit of a better end on that Lee Sim being a, a real nuisance for once in a way that sometimes he's been just a touch quiet in the early to mid games, not so much in the mid game this time around. Revolution is upon us. Tempo, mental fortitude, all oh, yeah. of these things are currently going in the favor of Rascal Jester, but DFM have been pushed up against before and we've definitely seen them overcome once before. Melvin is on coming to you to be my, uh, the voice of reason. Is there a voice of reason still, or are you are you just trying to still figure out what's going on throughout the series? I think that we will get a game five, but who wins it kind of depends on the draft, because I would say that's been the big, big sway of all of these games so far. Okay, Ebron, my our producer out there. Thank you, Ebron, by the way. Um, our producer up in the sky, wherever and everywhere. Um, make sure to get silver scrapes on. No, we, we're apparently going for it. Post-game breakdown is on screen, gentlemen. What are your thoughts? That's a gold loss right there. This yep. was kind of what it looked like the comeback happened last game, and now there was no extra part here. It's almost like if you just chopped the previous game off at the point where it looked like DFM had it in the bag. And unlike last game where it got turned around and Rascal just were able to come back and win, DFM just weren't able to. They didn't have the champions to do it at the end of the day. These similar to the previous one, are very situational in how they need to win. Akali needs a pop-off fight where she's not exhausted. You have to have these kind of things like the Jin able to skirt around the edge of the fight. Kind of hard to do against the Lee Sin. And then the Trundle, good against the Renekton, fine against the Alistair, everybody else. Yeah, he's a nuisance to them. The pillar is great, but nobody can follow up reasonably. It's... It's a, it's a lot to break down. I mean, I want to come back over to you, Initialize. I mean, do we want to see an Asian folks when we do something different? Obviously, you mentioned in our post-game four, game number three, looking, looking more towards game number four, the pick and ban phase. What would you yeah. like to see some adaptation from DFM and, and do Rascal Justice need to do anything differently? I think Rascal Justice felt pretty happy after that one. I think DFM tried to pull a bit of a curveball and pull out the Akali, pull out the Jin, try and throw something different. I, I don't think that was the way forwards. I don't hate the Trundle and Nah. I, I think they would have been largely fine when they've been up, but I think if you're going to be looking for like these counter picks for Aria, I don't think the Akali in this situation were. I, I, yeah, I, I think mm. considering the flexibility that they do have in draft, maybe just going for a bit of a different look in a composition might be a breath of fresh air, give them an opportunity, and maybe giving like Aria something better to work in into the Syndra because it was okay in lane and then kind of didn't get to do a lot later on. We did have an in interesting observation from Melvinism. I'm just going to take your point here quickly to give over to Counterfeit. Um, every single time that they keep doing this, they draft the first three rounds. Uh, they go Trundle, Leona, uh, Nah. Uh, they always force four bands onto Aria for the Jesters, and then on purposely not counterpicking, even when they own first rotation, they have the opportunity to counterpick that Syndra. Coming down to you, Counterfeit, 
I mean, for the jesters, some of the things don't quite make sense from the DFM camp. But if you're the jesters and a fan of the jesters and supporter, you have to be pretty happy. Do you want to see them do any other adaptations? Or are you pretty happy with how things are going? Or are you a bit worried that something might be hidden behind the scenes for DFM? I think, honestly, we're getting a lot to like here. I mean, you know, coming into this one, Kanatu getting the opportunity to kind of show that they are a major force to be reckoned with. I mean, Sol, well, you know, once they were getting those solo kills down the bottom lane, it mm. was just, honestly, it was just a wonderful experience. I've never been so happy. It was just great. <laughs> and also, you know, Hachimetra was the big question mark, exclamation mark coming in. But they weren't really performing. They weren't keeping up with the rest of the team. In that last game, on the Lee Sin that normally Steel is the one to shine on, they were more than adequate. So... I figured that in the last game, not changing the strategy would lead to being countered, but it didn't. So, while I think, like everyone else, it seems likely we go to a game number five, because there's got to be an answer for Destination Focus Me at some point. I, I'm still just about believing Rascal Jessica could run the same strategy and still get another win. Well, we will find out, ladies and gentlemen, but before we do, I want to hand it over to our lovely casters who can truly run us through not only their expectations of maybe a game five, but this pick and ban phase. Gentlemen, what's going to be happening? Do you want to see anything new? Uh, well, Mars Swan, I don't have any expectations of a game five. I was the only one who predicted that Rascal Jesters would be able to do it once again and take that game three. And I think with that mental advantage and honestly, the draft advantages that they've had throughout this series, that they're going to be able to take this. I'm more worried that he said, here are our lovely casters. And I was wondering if he was going to throw to someone else. <laughs> 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 oh god, the puns we've been pulling is, uh, yeah, maybe worthy yeah. of concern. And uh, as you're saying, I think for me, the, the drafts have been, for most of this season, DFM have gotten away with slight draft errors into yeah. slight draft arrogance. This has, however, come to the point where they just slip up and they just lose. They just lose at that point. We're going to those picks and bans again, so we're going to luckily go through them again. DFM not content to give the cluster over once again, but Rascal Jester more than happy to take away Arya's solo carries. Yeah, they've done the exact same thing every single pick ban phase, but that is a little bit different. DFM leaving up Souls Ezreal in exchange for recap Syndra. Got some big scatter of the weeks in that last game, and it is going to be the Trundle picked up, but the immediate response from the Renekton uh, with Rascal Jester's. Okay, so the Renekton locked in early. I mean, at this point, do DFM wants to... Well, basically, there's, there is going to be a trade of Azrael and Varus, most likely, because mm. uh, they're both fine into each other. I think that Rascal Jester would prefer themselves to have the um, the Azrael, but Diana into the Trundle. Um, so you are, you are not going to have a champion which is going to have the shredded of all their resistances. If Trundle yep. locks you in the fight, you can just Zonyas. That's a very powerful counter to the trundle style of play because you go in you engage and then suddenly you're you're invulnerable you don't care about being low resist dfm choosing to take the varus over the ezreal are they going to lock in a leona as well no it's going to be the silas and i love this because that means rascal jesters are not going to have a free alistair pick said this in last week and ban um if you lock in the alistair you must ban the silas dfm yep. very early just saying sure Take that, Alistair. That gives the ultimate over to Silas. And most of the time, I'm not a fan of saying, oh, you just picked Silas for the ultimate. That one is an outlier, though. You do not want an invincible Silas running you down with multiple Ws. And he's pretty good into a lot of recaps cool, which is mostly control mages. But this is mm -hmm. something a little bit different. We saw the rise piloted by Arya to great success in game one. And recap is going to be taking it away for himself here. They are, but I, I, I look at the Silas now and goes, okay, so... Merc treads angle, <laughs> like yeah, oh, you yeah. get you you get the MR yourself, and you have that Trundle Silas versus the Diana Rise. I favor the Trundle um, Silas in that TV too. I think that Silas can make an absolute mess of both of these side lane matchups if you get an advantage early. I think this is a very salient uh, Silas pick from DFM. You can understand why Rascal Jesters have banned away that pick for most of it. I think there are multiple Renekton encounters which you can pull out. I don't know what Ebi is going to go towards. Not the Nar, so it will be a second champion in uh, four games uh, for, that cha for that player. And now we have to see, okay, 
Bot lane for Rascal Jester's not going to get the safety of the Ezreal. Yeah. What else are they going to choose to ban? Do they want to ban away something like the Aphelios 2? Doesn't do so well in something like the Varus. But it is a pick which Sol goes towards quite a lot. Actually, Thresh might not be a ban here, bad ban here too. But it is, it, it, it's incredibly strange to me for Rascal Jester's where it has been the bot lane for these past two uh, matches that has been the the, the cause of, of, of a lot of their successes. Mm. And they opt not to take the ADC um, in that first rotation, meaning the couple of bands come out. Going to be the Leona locked in for secret, so Gang's going to have to play something different. And unless you've got something a little bit spicy planned as your ADC pick, I think you've just been throwing away stronger champions. Now, hear me out here. You could actually... Okay, the Alice is actually a very good pick yourself. I think that that's a good idea because, again, Rascal Jess is her on this... Well, in this game, because, of course, last game this applied to DFM engaging into the Alistair. This applies for Rascal Jester in this one. You have a low range composition right now. doesn't matter what yep. you lock in as the AD carry, particularly because the Ezreal and Varus are gone. You're likely to have a low range AD carry. Doing that on top of an Alistair really sucks. Yeah. This would be special to see being hovered. Ebby, for those of you that don't know, was a top play in Tom Kench player back in Season 7. He had games where he got triple kills on this champion. It's going to be locked in again. We have a couple of, dare I say it, signature picks coming out from DFM. Arias LeBlanc is one of his. Silas is the other. Ebby's Tom Kench alongside his Nart and Course Gang picking up the, uh, the Alistair as well. Gives a lot of historical power to DFM. Yeah, and you can really get down and dirty, brawl pretty heavily with the champions that you've got. A vein would be an interesting locking. Going towards the Jin, so a bit more of that utility style, mm. trying to kite away. But I'm seeing Rascal Jesters, they're relying a little bit on scaling here. Scaling with a Jin, though, which is always yeah. a little bit awkward. We saw the Varus into the Jin last time. It, it is a matchup which uh, Varus can can hold down the Jin. He doesn't tend to, to to bully out the Varus on his own right. And Jin, who's not playing from ahead, is less impactful as a, a damage threat. And we know that um, when we talk about Rascal Jester's early in the season a series, rather we said, okay, Sol, give him damage, give him agency. Yeah. We'll see what happens after that point. It feels like DFM have given that over to Arya this time, and Arya on a pick he can freely engage and make his own plays on is a terror to behold. So now, actually, I look at this draft and I think DFM flipped the script, and I think it's worked out better for them this time. Yeah, it definitely got uh, a lot more agency, and I think it's something that they needed to do because it clearly wasn't working Absolutely. in the past two games. You can't just keep butting your head against the wall and... Whilst they tried to chain things up in, in the game three with the Akali pick, the draft they've got now is a lot more coherent. Just a little point I noticed, we have actually swapped bot lane matchups. It was That's the, actually very uh, funny. I like that. It was, it was the yeah. Varus and the <laughs> Alistair for Solo Secret last game, the Jin and Leona yeah. for Utapon and Gang. So I don't know, man. If you want to see, if you want a test of bot lane skill, which one of these duos is actually the best, <laughs> I felt this is the perfect time to see it. <laughs> That's definitely one way to put it. That, that, that's a good point. I was too focused on the, wow, Silas picked in the first rotation. And if you're get, one of the things which I disliked about the FM banning out the Alistair in 4 5 and stuff like that, it's like, why don't you just pick the Silas early? Because doesn't Silas mm. just mean that you can't pick up the Alistair? Of course, Gang has his hands on that champion now. Of course, he was playing Leona for the rest of this series. And, uh,. I think this is a much more competitive draft. Last game was very hard to play for DFM. Um, I yeah, particularly da engaging into an Alistair is very difficult as a low range composition. I think that uh, the Diana and the Renekton and the Leona can certainly have issues with that this game. But Rascal Jesters have caught DFM napping more than once and caught their AD carry away from their team. They might have to do similar in this game because I feel like in a five v five situation, I think I favor DFM. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more about the picks, finding someone out of position. Utapond, we talked about him being Mr. Consistent for a very long time. Mm. He has not had a good series. And I think if there's going to be a player that's going to be able to catch him out, it is secret. Obviously, one of the clips that we looked at right back at the start of the yep. day was him turning around um, a play that DFM were making during that second round Robin game, I believe it was, mm. um, and really turning it, it on onto, um, onto DFM. So the potential is there for Secret, but I have to agree with you. The Alistair, uh, the, the Tom Kedge as well, are just nullifying picks that neutralize what Rascal Jesters want to do. And also, I mean... Uh, Tom Kench is a way that you can, of course it is that nullifying pick, you can say frontline, backline or whatever, but it's a significant anti-brawler pick too. You mean, yeah. you, you pick the next into it and suddenly you realize, wait, <laughs> wait, hang on, this guy has really good extended trades. If he gets through to um, extra cooldowns, particularly the tongue lash hitting, because now he recovers some missing HP when he lands that skill. 
Renekton needs to be wary that he is taking short trades where then he can uh, chunk out and heal up after better than the Tom Kench, rather than letting the Ebi have a long run at it. And uh, that can be very, very dangerous after that point. Might see that on the Rift, though, in the next 10 to 20 minutes. Let's get it on. Yeah, potentially our final match of the day. Rascal Jester's 2-1 up. DFM looking to save face a little bit and push mm. this to a game five. I think we're both favoring the DFM draft right now, but as we've seen so far in this series, it's not necessarily about the draft, it's about the execution. And Aria might be looking to execute Hatch and Metcher, taking a lot of damage on the Diana and forced out of his own jungle early on. So, there is no follow-up there. It wasn't like a W start from the Tom Kench to follow-up, nor is it that long range. It's going to force a recall out from Hatchimetra, but not in time for it to affect his clear at all. They do get deep vision in. That's the that's the bonus, yeah. right? You, you get a ward onto the buff, so Diana will now be seen on uh, on which buff they're starting. Because, of course, Diana doesn't necessarily want to start on, on a camp besides one of those buffs. DFM doing their due diligence and making sure that they haven't had vision traded back onto their side. But DFM... Seems to come into this level one with a bit more of a solid plan, and that is a good sign because, again, looking back particularly towards that last game, and of course parts of the game before that too, the two which they lost, they didn't look comfortable. They didn't look comfortable at all. They looked out of sorts. DFM return to the scene of the scene of the crime, though, as they see the hatch match is starting up here. They could go again for an early invade. Uh, it's a nice ward to spot them out, but this is going to be wasting so much time on the Diana that needs to farm up, that needs to get to that late game point. Rascal Jesters, though, doesn't look like they're giving this up. Secret has roamed up as well. Kanato is in the mix. They're taking a fair bit of damage, forced to slice away. And whilst they will be able to pick up this red buff for Hatch and Metcha, they've had to invest a lot to get it. They have. It does delay the uh, the start from the support, of course, but this leaves a 1v2 in the bot side for Sol because, of course, Secret roamed up for that play. Hachimecha is delayed on his start steal more so. I would say brief advantage to Rascal Jester for this, depending on what happens with the wave state at the bottom. Mm. Obviously, Sol having to respect Gang and Utapon right now. Once the level 2 comes through, a lot of engaged potential coming out of that lane. But with Secret making his way back down to the bot side of the map, Jens is going to feel a little bit safer. Now, you talked about this Tom Kench being mm. a, a, an anti-bruiser pick. Is this going to be a lane that's going to be a real struggle for Kanato? Is it looking a bit more into these team fights? Uh, so it depends on how the the, the XP differential goes. Abby, if he does get that, that um, you know, deny a couple of minions, I think then it becomes quite difficult for the Renekton to play out in the long term. Uh, see the level 2 to level 1 trade. I, level level 3 to level 2, level 2 to one, level, uh, level 1. Very dangerous for the Alistair. But looking towards the top lane again, yes. I do feel like Ebi, being such a uh, experienced player at this matchup, can also actually not taking the best 1v1s. I'm going to favor Ebi because I believe he's probably going to get himself a bit of an XP advantage and use that to uh, strong arm the matchup. Uh, Steel might try and strong arm Hachimecha in his own jungle. Does have push oh, in prior. both of his solo lanes. And we'll be able to spot up the Diana doing this blue buff. Roaming over, puts up the pillar, slows down the Diana, still has access to the flash, and more importantly, the smite. As Arya is trying to get around on the recap in the mid lane, who steps waiting. Oh! It's a solo kill for Arya, baby. Try banning out this, says Arya to his opposite mid lane. Remember, at the very start of the year, Arya comes into DFM. I was probably solo killed by Recap in their first game. Of course, they ended up winning that game back in spring, but Arya has not had the best individual laning stats in terms of the actual solo kill side of it, even though his XP and CS has been very high. Arya, low HP. The thing about Silas, though, is that he can stack up his pass its Conqueror so quickly, and you see how quickly he gets it racked up there. The amount of stats he gets onto that Kingslayer at the very end means he just completely slaughters the rise where he stands. And that is exactly what you want. DFM, a team of stars, but their star player, Arya, grabbing a solo kill early on versus the Rise, though, needs to scale into this matchup. It's been a decent start for them so far, but Arya might be caught out here. Is going back in onto Hatch and Metcha. Steel is Can in the area. But the healing is so huge from Arya. Recap doesn't have Flash available, won't be forced to need it as Steel runs out of the way. Might be a re-engage here, though. Arya's cooldowns are back. Drops the chains down. Gets a load of damage. But it's a kill going over to Hatch. Oh, no! And it's a second one. And Steel Auto's the minion disaster in the mid lane. He kills the minion. That's a oh, huge no. wave loss to Tower as well. That's actually a huge turnaround for Rascal Jester. You can understand the damage calculation. It feels like Arya has got it right. 
And then the extra auto attack comes through. The triumph comes through. Let's see how this starts up again. Because this is a cannon wave. That's very dangerous. Aria notices, oh heck, that's a lot of minions that can turn around on me. So he dashes into the... He goes onto Hatch Metro, realizing that's out of the range of the cannon minion. Goes to restart the play again. And chooses a bit of a dangerous way back to lane. He does have his regular abilities back up. But Recap has continued to chunk through everything. Recap stands in the middle of the minions. You can see how close it gets. He... Oh. Gets the cannon minion. He gets the range minion in the back there. If you can get one of those kills, he gets himself the trundle passive. He yeah. gets to turn himself around again. That's probably two kills the other way. Sad, sad times for DFM's mid jungle duo. And those are the mistakes that you really do not want to be making in this decisive That's match. The, but, but we've seen that before. We've seen yeah. them be shaken in this series. And dare I say it, this is not the level you can afford to have these shakes. This is the team that, you know, we put up on the pedestal and said, DFM, go to Worlds, make us proud. If they can't even see off their regional rivals, what hope do they have at that level? This is looking not that good for the LGL reigning champions. Yeah, what hope indeed. Zebi is actually feeling pretty good about this matchup. It's not a disaster. It's not the end of the world. The gold is still even, but like you mentioned, those mistakes mm. cannot happen on the world stage, definitely not against your regional competition. Six minutes, Drake is on the table, held in a couple. The Hatchimetra has really been accelerated on this Diana. He's already so. picked himself up the Hextech Alternator. You're going to be doing so much damage soon. It doesn't have the ultimate quite just yet, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Hatchimetra is going to be the, the player to watch for the next few minutes. Could be quite dangerous, of course, fighting with your Renekton quite far behind, down 20 mm. CS. We were talking about that matchup. We said, all right, yeah, probably going to favor um, Ebi just due to his experience in this matchup. But uh, as we can see, I mean, th the thing about that last play is you're, you're right. It is not suddenly, oh, TFM have lost. This is awful. It's just if that play had worked out, it's probably lights out because you give another yeah. cut, cut two kills over to the Silas, over to the Trundle, doesn't matter who they end up on. That is horrible for the Diana and the Rise who need to be ta taking the stat check and winning that 2v2. I even said, hey, that 2v2 from, from Trundle Silas is the one which I favor for DFM. I'm not sure I do when you've got two kills on the Diana. Exactly. Uh, Arya had the Dark Seal in inventory as well, so even more Juicy, stacks yeah. on that would have been huge. But now it's sort of wasted gold sat in his inventory, going to be delaying his item spikes. Bot lane looked a little bit rough early on while Sol uh, had to 1v2, drop down to a bit of a CS deficit, but it's fairly even right now. It is for now. And this bot lane, like you're saying, it's not really been the emphasis from either of these teams as the jungles have been called into the mid lane more often than not. So Dragon available, Herald being up again. None of these lanes really ang angling towards it right now. Although Ebi does have priority for the immediate Herald spawn. Steel doesn't choose to uh, start it on spawn though. Instead, heading down towards the mid lane once again, potentially trying to shield Arya as he shoves in. Yeah, they will be, start anyway. <laughs> will be starting up that Herald Ebi with a shove as well. Hatchimetra does have access to the Moonfall. No Mythic completed quite yet. We'll spot out this take. But no one from Rascal Jesters can mm. really contest this. DFM have had pretty good Herald control, but Rascal Jesters might be looking to change that. As there goes the Abyssal Aww. Dive, beautifully covered onto Hatchimetra, who gets a massive Moonfall, but will fall down. That is such a nasty combo. The Pillar into the Deep Water Dive, I believe it's now called for. Oh, the Abyssal Dive coming out from uh, the Tom Kench. It means that Hatchimetra just gets CC'd once bopped into the other bop, into the chain, into the chains and everything. That strong Diana doesn't get to impact that fight at a crucial point in the game. Going to go see it on the replay now. As you can understand, so Hatchmatcher does cue the Herald, understands it's not in a starting position. From that, sees that, oh. of course, is not going to be... Uh, it has been started up from that point. But that CC chain is absolutely disgusting. Doesn't matter if there's a uh, three per... Oh, it's because the... I, I didn't understand where that last take of damage came from. Arya steals the ult. That's where it comes on from. The stolen ah. Moonfall. Bit of a betrayal coming in from the Lunarius. Hatchimetra, as we said, just doesn't get to use this early power spike to do anything. Yeah, and the fact they used the ultimate there as well, didn't really get anything, means that there's a little bit of downtime where he can't have the same impact on the map as he would yeah. do otherwise. Again, not game over for either of these teams, but it's the story of, of a lot of the games in this series. It's been swinging back and forth. DFM coming out on top in the first game, but Rascal Jesters have had the better of it as we have progressed further forward. Harold went over to DFM earlier. Rascal Jesters are going to be happy to take up the Drake in the trade. 
There are. So, we now have a Herald to watch on the map. The Art Rascal Vessel trying to be spying out Steel across the map. I'd imagine he'd want to give that gold over to the Silas. I think the Silas, if they're ahead, yep. they get to a three-item spike where you have Everfrost, Cosmic Drive, and Zonyas. That's the point where Rascal Jesters find it very difficult to team fight because while you do have CC, the Zonyas buys time for the second King Slayer. It buys time for the extra healing, and you can steal so many good ultimates as that Silas in this game too. You've got the Moonfall and, the, well, you've got both of the, uh, the Leona Diana duo ultimates to steal, which are very, very important. I think that Rascal Jester cannot afford to let Ari get ahead, which is, again, why that early 2v2 play was so important for Rascal Jester to turn around. Still looking for something in the mid lane, but the roams coming out from the Rascal Jester members answering the aggression from DFM, which is something we have seen them do time and time again. Just going to be a couple plates taken by this Rift Herald, but gold on Arya, definitely what you want. Mm. So, of course, they can't use it to crack down the entire turret, but when you have a double melee um, a jungle against wave clear from the likes of uh, the, the Diana and the Rise, you're not realistically going to get the full amount of value out of that neutral objective. It's still gold, 160 gold up to mid jungle. There's nothing to be sniffed at, and DFM will, of course, uh, increase their meager lead to something a bit more substantial through that play. Ebi continues to have their CS dominance on the top side, although they've yet to get involved in the game outside of that Herald fight. Uh, we'll have to track that as it goes on and see how much of a team fight impact they can have on this lane dominant pick so far. Yeah, because that's one of the things that Renekton is is actually so, so good at. is mm. memed a lot as this champion that is just there to win the lane. But if you're an ADC player and a Renekton is jumping on top of you in a team fight, it feels very bad. And with <laughs> Utapon not having the best series, I think Kinatu can really look to flex the Crocodile's power onto the Varus. Absolutely, but you have to do that through the Pillar of Ice, through the Headbutt Pole, through all of the CC coming yeah. in, and of course the, the ability to disengage your carry in a way that only Tom Kench can with the Devour, though he'd like to be using it aggressively. <laughs> it's a difficult job for Kanati, who, um, of course, uh, the, the one thing which has kind of uh, persevered through the item rework for champions like a Aatrox and Renekton, even though they do scale better now with stuff like the Gore Drinker, is yeah, but you can just kind of disengage them. Like, what happens yeah. if you just manage to get them away from, get the carries away from them and keep them at arm's length? What do they do? Answer is, well, not that much. CFM once again converging in the mid lane. Obviously, no Herald to pop down here, but I like the attention that they're giving to this Silas. They recognize that it is going to be a strong point for them mm -hmm. as we get later and later on into the game. And Steel trying to do his namesake, take away this red buff, but Rascal Jesses once again are able to respond with members, but they're not quite there in time to take away the buff. No, Arya choosing not. I was wondering if he was going to go uh, steal a solar flare at that point. I might do now. A secret is caught out. Yeah, forced to flash back as Kinata is one of wanting heavy on the bat side. Goes back in. <laughs> and is taken down immediately. This is a fight that you're not winning for DFM, but there's a very big moonfall coming up from Hachimecha, who does drop down. Slivers of health bars for Rascal Jester members as the Devour up onto Recap takes him out. It's a four for zero for DFM, and that's a little bit more meaningful. The as well, is getting TP'd on. It's like game one, forced to flash back, but Arya will chase forward, gets the stun, and it deducts any hope of Sol escaping the fight. I understand why he didn't take that Solar Flare now. <laughs> Just finds the uh, the most unorthodox use for chasing down kills, still in the Realm Warp in a way which is very rarely useful for that Silas. And much like the first two games, DFM finds the, the play after a couple of increments of pressure, stepping up, walking in, taking the red buff, making sure the Rascal Jesses have to respond, but then just skill checking them on the outset of that play, saying, all right, okay, so you're in the right area of the map. Now start to learn how to dance. They don't end up avoiding the important skill shots. And yes, Diana gets a good combo, but this uh, mid jungle 2v2, once the skills start racking in, there just isn't enough damage to go through their regen. The Trundle passive, the, the Kingslayer, everything else is too much for Rascal Jester to win the extended fights. And like I said, that, uh, that Realm Warp just inspired for Arya. Yeah, it's getting flashbacks to game one, that play in the bot side where Sol has a very unfun time when the Ash gate yes. jumped on is not having fun in that team fight. And DFM finally, after a couple of games not looking too hot, build themselves a meaningful early yeah. advantage. Also, I mean, like, at the start of that last play, you can see how much work Steel did against Secret, who <laughs> procs the Aftershock, and then, of course, gets uh, altered by, by, mm. uh, by, by the Steel Ultimate, right? The Subjugation, where he just 
whacks off all of those resists, the aftershock falls off, and they just melt. They absolutely melt. They survive about two seconds after they're engaged and they go down. Um, and that's something which is really dangerous now for Rascal Jester, because Sol is not in a position to 1v9. So Jin is not no. a high damage champion, especially not versus this team, which have ways to regen, have ways to keep them from doing optimal DPS and uh, continuing to auto-attack. And Secret is not in a position to safely engage either, because, uh, okay, okay. recap flash again. Immediately onto Ebi, he flashes back himself, but Hill gets hit by the Moonfall. That's going to be the escape coming out for Rascal Jesters, getting out with a kill and their lives. A close run stuff because that Everfrost, if it landed the route onto Rise, would have, uh, of course, delayed that escape. But Ebi flashes out, still caught by the CC from Hatchimetra. Good pickoff from Rascal Jester, and an equally good escape. Of course, Ebi still has teleport, and the second Herald uh, being started up from DFM might be able to return back to that mid lane and open up that tower, which will be very important to deny some of that uh, priority which Rascal Jesters have had due to their wave clear advantage from their mid jungle 2v2. Oh, this is a TP from Recap back into the bot lane. So Rascal Jess is recognizing that they cannot contest in the mid side. Oh, the Herald actually hell, being okay. stopped by DFM as Rascal Jess has pulled them towards the Drake and DFM say, nah, 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 this is ours. Yeah, because DFM are presented with, haha, you can go for the Herald, but we'll take the dragon. Then DFM say, but what happens if we just go to the dragon? What if we just go for kills? Oh my God, Hatchimetra completely blown up for the third time this game. Is and uh, getting a bit hypey there because though it is one kill, that is a kill onto the jungler. While Dragon and Herald are both still alive, while yep. DFM are one two down, that kind of kill to keep the pressure on, keep the momentum rolling through, is so damn important for DFM. That is such a pivotal kill because now DFM can just do whatever the hell they want for the next couple of minutes. Yeah, it's such a pivotal kill in like in terms of the series. The momentum, the mental was all meant to be with Rascal Jesters, but DFM. They found it. They found that star quality. Why they're so good is they're able to win even when they shouldn't. They haven't closed out this game yet. Rascal Jesters can still take the 3-1. But with the advantages they've built for themselves, DFM are in a much better spot than they've looked for a very long time. Absolutely. And a lot of that does come from uh, the real show of class we've got from uh, DFM's mid laner and Aria, right? You know, I, I I talk so much about them. It has become a meme uh, and it's you? one which I'm more, I am more than happy to go for because it is such an entertaining player to watch when they are on their choice champions. And no, they haven't really been given priority in the draft for most of the split. And for most of the split, it's worked out because their champions pool has been so large. It hasn't mattered that they haven't got their choice of their first two picks. Kinatu gets away from that turret and uh, keeps himself safe. But yeah, DFM turning towards their star mid laner to carry them when things get very, very bleak for them. It seems to be working out right now in game four. Looking very, very nice. Four, one, and four on the Silas. has got 10 seal stacks on that dark seal as well. Could potentially see a Magi's this game. Would be very nice. Still able to solo up this Herald. Herald prioritization from DFM has been very, very high in this series. But Rascal Jesters are trading in the bot lane, trying to pick up this tower. Although Arya might have something to say about it. He's going to pop the solar Moonfall. Hatchmetcher doesn't connect on his own one. And DFM save the tower in the bot side. Sadly, because Arya knows between all of his uh, different abilities, Everfrost, and then a stolen Moonfall, it's like, yeah, I could probably wave clear that. Denies Rascal Jester for another wave. It buys Utapon a chance to reset, which means that Recap cannot reset on this wave. Get back towards mid lane. Do DFM now have, an, uh, have a, a mismatch somewhere that they wouldn't have done without that play? We'll have to see, but it just, again, keeps Rascal Jester's on the back foot. It reduces their options. This is what people mean by tempo. Arya forces Rascal Jesters to take some extra time in something which should have been easy for them, reducing yeah. their options and forcing their hand for the next minute of play. Yeah, and I mean, still does have that Herald in pocket, mid lane tower, I think low enough that it would just get knocked down. Died so, to a single charge, yes. Yeah, if DFM want to make a concerted play around this mid part of the map, they can definitely do that. Drake isn't spawning for a little while, so can't use it to gain pressure on that just yet. And I love this. It's a, it's a That's the Scryer's Bloom backwards to make sure Rascal Jester don't have a Canal 2 flank or don't have a way to punish DFM as they are trying to up the tempo, try and force Rascal Jester to, to their own beat. So DFM going to summon that Herald mid lane. And again, all of this works up to make sure Rascal just is out of options to respond to it. Yeah, and look at Soul right now. One, oh, zero, one, and zero hasn't had an impact this game. Aria might be looking to reduce that even further as he does get the stolen server flare, lands with the trains. That is a disgusting amount of CC as there goes Gang into the middle of Bachimetra, gets the Moonfall, but it's not quite enough. 
first kill of the fight going over to the trundle opening up with the curtain call here comes soul doing the damage on the backside a couple of low health bars but he just can't connect onto them with the bullets aria turning it around pops into the zonyas as alistair goes pop and here come russell just as going forward ebby Ooh. will not be long for this world as the zenith blaze connects but he's turning it around one more <laughs> hit would do it as soul picks up the kill so close dfm playing right on the edge juice pod has flash oh no way no way oh <laughs> close run stuff so dfm once again just pushing the pushing the, the speed of this game even further yeah. forward just going towards that out of turret using the herald to crush it open that could have gone so much worse for dfm because they could have lost so many kills on the back side of that where does this start starts with for the first time the stolen solar flare and soul hasn't gone for a cleanse this game because normally you think hey i mean maybe we can just get away with it go towards the 2v2 DFM re-engage aggro with the Alistair, but key to this is Hatch and Metzger getting a yeah. massive turnaround. Yes, they give their life for it, but they stop the clean kill onto Sol. They stop the amount of DPS coming from D uh, DFM being optimal, whereas Sol gets to walk backwards. Doesn't matter what HP is on if he's two screens away. Arya has himself, uh, I'm trying to remember if he has double stopwatch at this point. No, he doesn't. He does get out, but the Realm Warp turnaround, very heads up a recap to make sure that they do finish up with a uh, at least a 2 for 2 out, all said and done. I think Watley's looking at this, maybe thinking that the Tom Kedge could have won if he was playing it, but that was so, so <laughs> close. Steel, um, Arya both escaping on slivers of HP as Gang does oh, not stop CC. going forward. So much CC, secret falling down. Secret falling down for a second time, of course. Uh, he's been actually more useful as an enemy engaged to all that stolen ultimate in this last minute or so, and that's kind of a sad situation to be because he's trying to, again, push the envelope, go towards the edge of what is safe to do, and Gang is just going into the base! Yeah, it's not safe for Hatcher Vetcher to stand near his inhibitor, apparently. will use the Moonfall in combination with the Zonyas, buying more time. Recap is on the back side of the fight. One more hit will take out the Diana, but here comes Kidatu. The stolen Moonfall does so much damage onto the rise that he can't do anything. Ebi now is 1v3 in the back side of the fight. will just make it away as DFM, this is how good you are, going all in in the enemy base, finding every single member of Rascal Jester. Okay, that's what we wanted to see this series. The FM understanding that they have the ability to traverse these towers very, very quickly, especially when they have something like the Alistair Ultimate to bridge the gap, take a couple of tower shots for free because it just doesn't matter after that point. The FM... Uh, this is the kind of play we expect from them to just close yeah. games out in the way they have done most of this split, at least towards the last couple of weeks. This time it's the Flash, not the Alistair Ultimate, really telling the story of this. Because, I mean, yes, you're in the base, but once you're past the towers, what does that matter? It's just anywhere else on the map. Ebby making sure that Utapon stays safe, gets the extra shield from uh, everything else involved too. And of course, the, the Conquerors are stacked up by this point. The second round of cooldowns are back up. And Rascal Jesters, they can't stand a fire. They don't have the DPS from their AD carry. They don't have something like an Aphelos, which just ends the fight from this kind of uh, from this kind of vantage point. DFM put Rascal Jesters to the sword. Yeah, and it's so trying to do as much as he can. We sure he was able to take down Utapon on the back side of the fight, but the Jin cannot deal with the bruises in the same way that something like mm. an Aphelios, like a Jinx, would be able to. And DFM really turning up again in this series it feels like game one all over mm. again but they've lost from leading positions before this series it was they an have. 8k gold comeback for rascal jesters in game two but dfm are looking so much cleaner this time around and, and dare i invoke something from uh aria's uh, silas history back when he was on cga because back in spring 2020 uh, in our first split where we cover them, Arya had himself a 20 Medrai stack game on that champion Ooh. versus the Rascal Jess's different lineup, different support. That was Vivid back then, who picked a Blitzcrank into him. And in the hyper late game, even though Arya had been killing everyone left, right, and center, all it took was one fight for him to get silenced, shut out of the fight, and they lose off of that. I don't think it's going to be that bad in this game. I think there are other people that you can turn towards and ask them to carry for you. And Gang goes in onto Hatchimetra, denying the Diana engage. Yeah, forced out of the fight as the teleport is coming through from Arya. There is no way for Hatchimetra to go. Trying to run back towards his team, but the combo comes in again from Gang. The Moonfall is dropped, though. The Alistair very tanky in the front line, but here comes Ebi. There goes the damage. Here comes DFM as Kinatu is escaping with a slither Oof. of HP on the backside of the fight as Arya is trying to dive forward, but Ebi says, nah, nah, nah. Now, 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 I'm going to do this all myself. Soul with the damage, though, onto the Alistair. He has to kite this one out, but Arya is just going for beautiful Gale Force of the Jin to just escape as here comes the curtain call. It may be curtains for Rascal Jesse. He can't quite hit Arya, 
as the final shot comes out and DFM take another team fight. And notice how all of these fights are happening deep within Rascal Jester's territory. They're all happening on DFM's terms too, because Rascal Jester, while they might be looking to, um, I guess, punish DFM from overstepping, from going too far forward, much in the way that we saw V3 do to the Hawks earlier in the playoffs when they tried to push across, DFM sniff out the engage, they have the right vision, they have the uh, the blocker of this Alistair doing so well at denying Rascal Jess as the turnaround, that DFM get to take these fights with impunity, and they get to keep pushing on their lead. See how powerful even Steel is at this point, because it's not like everyone is focusing on the Trundle. Trundle in like a 1v2 at this point is more than fine once he's popped his ultimate, especially from this gold lead and this XP lead as well. Utapon can fire across the fight in any other way, and the, the hopscotch back and forward from Ari and Ebi is uh, a little bit fun to see. Is uh, At this point, between two towers, again, they can just keep juggling aggro with their mobility and their increased damage from, from just the, the ability to hit people from such a long range. DFM so hard to deny in these fights. Yeah, looking incredibly aggressive, looking incredibly powerful. Baron Ooh. is on the table right now, and with the pressure that they've got, especially in this topside jungle, you'd have to feel this is something that DFM can play towards. Instead, it will just be this top lane. Tau was taken low in that last fight and will be taken um, down. I think what I want to really kind of ask a question about, though, is that if you are a DFM fan watching out there, just think to yourself, are you feeling... You know, is this jubilation or is this relief? Because let's be honest, this game was won. DFM have not found themselves in a position to search out the likes of very often. They're going to find Secret again. That's probably going to be an easy kill. But DFM, is this just a victory march or is this something they've needed all series? Yeah, they absolutely did. As that's going to be the owner dropping down again. And they say to hell to the mid lane push. They're going to pop back to the Baron. I'd have to say it's relief right now. Being at match point down, this is the sort of game that DFM and DFM fans needed because, okay, the Juggernaut match, you could pop down to the lower bracket, but you do not want to be losing a best of five series to Rascal Jesters as Gang is Bad going in on to recap, who's trying to flash back and buy some time, but he can't buy a damn thing. Kinato is going to be dropped as well. Soul Gale forcing away. The Tongue Lash comes out. The Abyssal Dive as well. The Jin just can't cut fast enough as there comes the Moonfall to try and buy some time from Hatch and Metcher. One more shot onto Soul would take him down as he's going to be falling as well. It is the victory march for DFM. They're going to be taking down this inhibitor and taking us all the way to game five. Alas, poor inhibitor. You, we knew you for about three seconds before you ended up getting destroyed again, DFM. Might get so sued for property damage after that one, but Rascal Jester got a whole hospital bill to settle before that as DFM bring us to game five. The Nexus is falling. Rascal Jester fans are balling. One game left, one game to decide it all. It's going to be Silver Scrapes, baby. The race to the top is a harsh one, and it's been much closer than we have thought. Um, DFM having to stare down the barrel of a of two match points from Rascal Jesters, of course, bring themselves to a single one. There is no deuce in League of Legends, thankfully. I think they'll be going all day at this rate if they're this close. DFM, like we said, this is the relief game. You've got yeah. one more chance as the Rascal Jesters to seal the win. Yeah, as all the DFM fans on the analyst desk will be feeling a lot happier after that one. I imagine Counterfeit might be sweating a little bit. We're going to pop to a short break, but then they're going to be breaking down this game and looking forward to the decisive game five.
Ladies and gentlemen, with great honor and privilege and pleasure, I get to announce that the LGL OU in a juggernaut match is going to Silver Scrapes. I will not grace you all with my version of it. It's um if you've been around if you've been around for a few years potentially with us here at the LGL OU, you will have heard it several times before. But I think where I want to go with this first is over to initialize. Because yeah. DFM actually got the win. And it did. hey, in pretty good fashion. It was. I, I've, got, I've got a prop for you. Just, just a second. Oh. Oh. It's like, got to move to get. Where's he going? What's he doing? So he... what I want to say is the NAR went away and instead mm. the ribbit was uninhibited. Oh. Uh, Tom Kench coming out. That's where you want to take it. And, and, and yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's that's see melvin as well has printers i have random musical instruments and that that's what i had to work with and i think it was a good shift honestly big cs leads the top and then of course ari as well shifts up his mid lane kind of pick and does a really good showing on the side is very aggressive very much feeling himself and just you saw how much more comfortable dfm looked in this one it was just a bit refreshed rascal just seemed to have a bit of a number on how to play against the champions they were so Bit of a quick switch in those solo lanes. The trundle still looks good. Alice is on the ga oh, ga gang's on the Alice. Let me invert that little phrase. And that kind of just those little brief shifts seem to give DFM a lot more of the aggression, a lot more of the playmaking they need in the early stage to snowball as they have been wont to do over the last few weeks. So credit to them for coming back and bringing it to that game five. Our very own initializers, a maestro of many instruments. Ebi and Aria are maestros of many champions, and that's where we get to mirror it up. Counterfeit. Um, I'm sorry, buddy. Um, I know we all came into this expecting DFM to win 3-0. Even you were like, well, it might be a tough one, but I'll believe in them. Uh, we're at school for scrapes, sir, and this was um, uh, maybe kind of a replay. What, what are your thoughts on this match? Oh, boy. I will take a small side of the thing. I think I was the only person who predicted it was going to go to five games. Uh, uh, yes, yes, definitively. No one else thought it would go to five games. <laughs> so I'm still on track, more or less, to where it needs to be. I mean, certainly, game four definitely felt like a step back for Rascal Jester. You know, going back to the same game length as game one, and kind of almost having the same game as game one as well. If, you know, we still are in a situation where Rascal Jester have taken two step fours, and I think Sol is the big one to come out of that. As I say on the cast, it didn't necessarily feel like Sol had the maybe the best champion to be able to make as much of an influence as they were going to make. But that's the big difference for me between Game 1 and Game 4, is that we did get to see at least a little glimmer of the fire that Sol can start up for the Rascal Jester team. It's not great to come into Game 5 just off of a loss, and especially off of a hard loss, but I still believe in the Jesses. I still believe we could see a massive upset. Thinking forward. about the predictions and everything. Sorry, go for it, initialize. Just, just on that note as well, mm. briefly before I throw this out again, I was like, beginning of that game, we all went and winced here on the green room as we saw the AI bot basically say 58% mm. chance, just like a bit of a draft difference as well. I, I want to call that one out before we go too much further because Sol on the gin was okay surviving, but didn't get a lot done. And that was a big thing, I think. Absolutely. I just want to quickly mention predictions, call out to our community. Quincy actually is the other person that did predict a three and two. And random.io for once seems like it actually might be correct. So we'll have to see. Melvin, is, I need to throw it over to you very quickly because you've got a clip to break down as well as also just to give your opinion. So let's go into it. I do. So let's take a look at this one that we got for us. And this is where I think the game was truly lost for Rascal Jester because when we were talking about the draft war, these things... While parts that have changed is putting agency on the people that you think can carry the game. Gang, giving them this Alistair to which the throat splintering gang play was made. Giving Arya Silas, which has been getting banned away from them in second rotation every time to protect recap Syndra, which they are finally off of now. For DFM, this is already a better start. And Rascal Jester, they're looking at unfamiliarity for all intents and purposes with this rise pick that as we can see in this play, didn't exactly get done what we had from Arya's Rise of the first game. So looking at this fight right here, it's initially just Secret looking to scry some vision. So that's really the only part you need to be looking at at the moment. Just keep your eye on Secret and see how it goes because it starts off as a rather innocuous play, something that you don't really think is going to have any impact, where they're just walking around the corner, thrown into the pillar, 
instant knock up chase gets the flash down and then you can see dfm have started to converge on the side sol and utapon are now making this little line across here where it's going to be the two adcs having their battle you got this clump of three in the middle from both squads and secret is already on the back foot and then up here is the top lane is going at it and i will tell you if you have a level lead on tom kench which ebby does right now they will be basically every champion in the game so they are just going to be keeping them at arm's length and allowing this three stack that DFM have to really run wild on the opposition in the middle part. So let's keep an eye on that middle section for the moment as Secret decides that it's time to go in. And now we have Sol on the edge has started the Jin ultimate. The only issue is you may have noticed on the minimap, Utapon has been beelining for them. They're going to throw a chain of corruption and then just force them to back off here, which completely removes the ADC support from Rascal Jester. And what you may notice is if Renekton isn't getting ultimate into massive combo, if Diana isn't getting a massive moonfall, at this point in the game, 12 minutes, Jin is your only real consistent damage. Rise is not online yet. They could do decent things in these fights, but it is nowhere close to what Jin could be doing with just some auto attacks and finishing off kills of the ult. So keep your eye on the middle stack a bit more. As you see, Gang goes in, everybody tries to commit. They get a big moonfall, but the thing is, the DFM squad is quite tanky. And at this point, they're able to just chase them down. Utapon, in his little 1v1 over here, has effectively forced Sol away. And now, because of how well it has gone for DFM on the back line here, Sol isn't safe to just run this way, because there's just the chance that Gang can flash the wall, they could go around the corner. There's so many different options where, at the end of the day, it's just very sad for Sol. So, we do have them trying to run the only safe angle they have, and that is this way. You may have noticed, Arya is back on the rise suddenly. And it goes horribly for Sol, as the only survivor from this fight initially. Everybody gets blown up in the middle there, no survivors for Rascal Jester, and... They think that their ADC gets out. No, they're just chased down, and that is the end of the fight. It is a 5 for 0 at 12 minutes. This is when the snowball started for DFM, leaving them with a massive gold lead. And they just took it from there and absolutely ran with it. It was honestly amazing. Melvin, thank you so much for doing these breakdowns. It's really insightful to actually get that information. It's fun. Seriously. It's a, but there we go. You're having fun. We're loving it. We're learning. And we also sound like we know what we're doing more because you're you're kind of doing that. So thank yeah, you. Thank you very cool. much. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm and we're actually going to cut it short here at the desk. We're going to go on a break. You've got a certain song to appreciate on that break. And when we come back, game five, Silver Scrapes will be upon us. We've got a lot to go through and we need more time. So we're going to go to a break and we'll be right back very soon. See you soon, everyone.